Okay. So um, I see that people are starting to join us and uh, welcome to all of you who are joining us for this terrific talk that we're gonna be having with the top corporate board search team in America. We are so thrilled to have this team with us today. We're all gonna learn so much, especially me. I don't know anything about corporate board service, as you all know, because you're always asking me questions about how do I get on a corporate board? And rather than make up an answer, I went to the top and I, I brought in the, the best ladies in the business to talk to all of you about um, how exactly you get on a corporate board and what makes the most sense. Um, so I see the room filling out. Um, uh, just so you all know, uh, just I'll fill time for about 30 more seconds here and then we're gonna dive in because I wanna get you all off by one o'clock because I know everybody has lots they have to do today. Um, we are recording this session. If everyone, anyone has to leave early, um, we'll be sending you a recording of the session within the next 24 hours in our follow-up email. So you don't even have to ask for the recording. I'm just gonna assume everyone's gonna wanna watch it twice because you can never get enough of Sarah and Suzanne. Uh, so I'll, I'll be sending that your way. Um, and I'm gonna just uh, start with a few quick introductions. Uh, as you know, I'm the executive director and founder of Nonprofit Board Assist. We are the leading personalized nonprofit board matching service in the country. And we are very, very happy to work with everybody who's tuning in to help you find your dream board or your second board or your third board. As you all know from hearing this from me endlessly, we really all need, we need you to join many, many boards. But my hunch is you are much more interested in hearing what Sarah and Suzanne have to say today. So um, Sarah Burley Reed and Suzanne Burns are both partners uh, in the Spencer Stewart, Stewart Corporate Board Search Group. And uh, the group is led in North America by Julie Dom, who will be joining us shortly. Uh, you all have their bio information in the press release that you received when you signed up for this. Uh, we are just so thrilled to have them. The Spencer Stewart team is responsible for over 50% of the corporate board matches affected in this country every year. So when I say that we went to the best and brightest people in the corporate board search space to put this event together, uh, that's exactly who we went to. And I'm, I'm just so grateful and thrilled that Sarah and Suzanne are here with us to, to share all their wisdom. Um, so with that in mind, um, Given that I come from the nonprofit board world, um, and many of you know me in that capacity, capacity, we thought that we would start with just some questions about the difference between corporate and nonprofit board service. Um, so, Suzanne, um, how does corporate board service differ from nonprofit board service? Well, non nonprofit board service is a is a fantastic foundation for uh, for profit. Um, you learn a lot about governance, you learn how to work with, with people that come from different backgrounds, you learn how to be a board member uh, versus an executive or a member of management. Um, you, you learn about the protocols and, uh, and, and the, the governance aspects of, of how to, to, uh, to run a, a smooth strategic and, and succession planning process. All, all of that happens within nonprofit. But when, uh, when you move to a for-profit scenario, um, there are, are uh, increased obligations and, um, uh, and, and legal responsibilities that come with that. Um, there are often um, more uh, materials to, to review and uh, it's, it's more time consuming from how you participate in committees um, and be available uh, at the spur of the moment as issues come up. Um, you get compensated, which is, which is great <laughs> in, in most cases, uh, which is why a lot of people do it, but it does have um, a, a longer lasting um, uh, impact on the organization and often people join corporate boards and stay on for, for quite a while. It's, you don't move on and off as, as quickly as you might in, the, in a nonprofit world. Um, Suzanne, that, that's so helpful. And um... You know, one thing that Suzanne left out that um, I would add as, as somebody in the nonprofit board space, so she highlighted that um, on a corporate board, you're likely to get paid. On a nonprofit board, not only are you not going to get paid, you are going to be raising money and giving money. So um, that's a really, really big difference. Um, 
And, um, you know, that, that's something to keep in mind. But I, I think what Suzanne highlighted very effectively is that um, even though you are getting paid for your time in corporate board um, service work, um, it is a very big obligation. So um, it's not one to be taken lightly. And Sarah, um, do you think that nonprofit board service is helpful if you're um, interested in joining a corporate board? Is that a good stepping stone? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's very helpful, as, as Suzanne started to say. Um, first of all, it's great training and what it means to be a board member, as, as she mentioned. You also develop a lot of technical skills around being a member of different you know, types of committees, whether it's audit or non-gov or whatever the case may be that you can then bring into the, the corporate boardroom. Um, it also often puts you in touch with other board members of, you know, of the nonprofit who may be corporate board members in another part of their life and therefore connects you to a broader universe of people who may help you get onto a corporate board and educate you further about what it means to be on a corporate board. Um, and then lastly, I mean, it, it being on a nonprofit board shows um, people that you're serious about contributing to an organization from a governance perspective that you care, that you want to be a leader in a boardroom, that you want to be um, a steward of an organization in general. And so it's a very good signal um, to others that you're serious, uh, you mean business, and you can contribute at that type of a level. Um, so you should just know that Sarah was not paid by board assist to say that, uh, but I really hope everyone heard what Sarah just said. So joining a nonprofit board is a great first step to going on a corporate board, and we love to hear that. And you know, we so believe that. And the only thing that I'll that I'll add to that is that it's really important when you choose that nonprofit board that you choose one where you really the the mission really resonates with you, and you're going to be able to meet the obligations, time and financial, and be a superstar. Because as Sarah pointed out, this is a great networking opportunity for you to meet some people who um, really may help you in your corporate board journey, but it only works if you're a superstar on that nonprofit board. So if you join this board because you saw three people that sit on corporate boards that you wanna be part of um, on, that, on that board, but then you don't show up for meetings or you don't meet the financial commitment or you're not a superstar, it's not gonna move your goal forward. So it's really, really important if you are looking at nonprofit board service as a first step towards corporate board service, that you are very careful about um, picking the right board. And as you all know, if you go on the Board Assist website, on the FAQ tab that is available at the top of every page of the website, boardassist.org, we have a little booklet that talks about everything you should think about before you join a nonprofit board. Because we want, we want you to all be board superstars. We know you will all be board superstars. And when you'll become a board superstar, Sarah and Suzanne are gonna come find you for a corporate board. <laughs> um, which, which reminds me, uh, just a high, housekeeping item. After this um, webinar we're doing today, you'll be getting a follow-up email with reach information for how to reach Suzanne, because we know you all wanna send your information to Spencer Stewart. And you would be wise to do that since they are the top, of cor top corporate board matching um, organization uh, and group uh, in the country. Um, so uh, we're gonna bifurcate the session a little bit talking about corporate boards and then uh, fund boards in particular, because so many um, members of the board assist family work in the financial services community. Um, and so uh, Sarah and Suzanne thought that would be very helpful. Sarah, can, can you just talk to us for two seconds about what is, what is a fund board versus a corporate board? What is that distinction? Right. Well, um, so fund board is usually when you hear someone talk about that, you were referring to a mutual fund board or an ETF board. And, and these are boards that exist to um, uh, protect the interests of the shareholders of those funds, right? So um, usually there is a board for a specific mutual fund complex or ETF complex that is, that is managed by a, an investment firm. So it, um, as, I, as we'll develop as we're talking further, there, there are, seem to be two different paths, a corporate board path and a fund, hun, uh, a fund board path. It's, it's a little bit different. Well, I wouldn't describe them necessarily as two different paths. Um, they're, they're two different types of boards, but they're both corporate in effect, right? Okay. Um, um, yeah. 
Okay, good, good. Um, so um, one thing that I should, I, I should have mentioned earlier to our attendees, um, we're at the point of the pandemic where you're all Zoom pros and you could all go work at Zoom. But for those of you who might need the reminder, uh, there is uh, the, the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and I'll be looking uh, for any questions that you wanna post as we get started. Um, so I can feed those to Sarah and Suzanne in addition to all the great questions we've already planned in advance. So starting with, um, I know everybody wants to know, what are top companies looking for in for-profit board candidates? And I hope, we're hoping Suzanne, you might start on that one. Sure. Um, so I think first and foremost, um, particularly if it's your first board and that, um, that the chemistry is, is right with uh, the individual and the other uh, board members. Uh, often uh, pre-pandemic, uh, there were a lot of dinner meetings <laughs> that took place in connection with getting a board seat because uh, the other board members wanted to test that chemistry. You know, am I comfortable hanging with this person? You know, and in the trenches, if something go, you know, go, it gets, uh, gets rough and we've got to spend a lot of time together as board members. Um, and as I mentioned before, Unlike an executive role, it's not something that you do for three to five years in a lot of cases. There's a longevity to it and, and you stay on these boards for quite a while unless something unusual happens, the company gets sold or, or there's something you know, else, else that disrupts that. But um, so, so first of all, it's, it's, it's the chemistry and long-term commitment. Obviously, then there's also the criteria that they're looking for, usually against what we call a strategic skill matrix. Um, so the board is comprised by, of, of a group of people that all have a role to play on the board. Um, some are financial experts, some might have run significant p &Ls, some might have industry or channel experience, et cetera. And often when there's a new board seat, there, there's a gap in that matrix somewhere in, in terms of either um, strategies that they're planning or governance issues that they're facing and they're, they're trying to plug that round peg in that round, round hole, <laughs> so to speak, right? So they're, they're trying to find somebody that has experience in, in that potential industry or, or with that channel, somebody who has the functional responsibility um, and, and experience, somebody who has faced a similar situation to what the company is facing. And so understanding exactly what that is and, and how you can immediately add value um, is, is uh, increases your likelihood of, of success on, on getting on boards. Um, and also it goes without saying, you know, the, the integrity uh, and value system of the individuals is so important, particularly for, for poor profit and, and public boards. Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, liability that goes along with serving on, on a board. So, we do very thorough background checks on anybody that uh, that we place on uh, on for-profit boards. Um, so yeah, we just got a bunch of questions coming in about age um, and whether there was uh, there's a minimum age or there's a maximum age. I, I can't imagine that there's a maximum age, but somebody was concerned sure. that at a certain point you might be too old for board service. So, so I'd, I'd encourage you, if you haven't seen it already, I'd point you to a publication we do every year, which is called the Spencer Stewart Board Index. And, and we published it just in December of this year for 2020. It's on our website and it really uh, charts the trends year over year of what the S&P 500 boards are, uh, are experiencing. In there, you'll see the average age, I think it's like 67 or something like that for, for S&P 500. Now that's, you know, the, the top of the top of the, uh, uh, of the board, board world, if you will. But um, to answer your question about age, we're increasingly seeing uh, people younger uh, and earlier in their career come on boards, particularly if they have skill sets associated with, strategies that, that older board members might not have. Um, for example, in the area of, of digital and sustainability, some of those areas are, are really hot right now, uh, ESG related uh, items, diversity and inclusion. So um, there's no minimum 
Uh, they, you know, most boards are looking for somebody who has enough gravitas when they come into the board to be able to conduct themselves appropriately and bring enough strategic value to the conversation. So you have that comes with some world experience and, and professional experience. Um, and then in terms of the upper age limit, some boards do have term limits. Some boards do have age limits. Um, we're, and, and that information is in the index as well. But you know, you, you usually don't bump up to that until you're in your mid to late 70s. Um, so it gives you quite a bit of a way to, to be able to explore boards throughout, the, throughout your career. That's so helpful. Um, so um, how does one get noticed for corporate board service? How, how, do, how do people get on your radar? We're not fortunate to be with you two today in this venue. So um, the, the way I describe uh, pursuing a for-profit board, it's, it's a, a multi-step process and it really depends where you want to land, especially for your first board. So what's really important is that uh, your first board really be a home run uh, because all of your future boards if you're going to build a board portfolio are gonna be referenced off that first board. So usually that means that you're, you're finding a board that's pretty close to home in terms of where you've spent most of your career, either functionally or industry-wise, uh, is of a size and scale that is familiar to you as well. Um, and so that you're not doing too, anything too far off of what, what you're familiar with. Um, so a lot of times that comes through just you building your reputation through your professional career. Um, I call it the friends and family program <laughs> where somebody, and, and to your point about nonprofit uh, board service before, somebody has seen you in action, either on a, a nonprofit board or within your own company or you know, through your, your professional networking within your community, it says, you know, this person really has what it takes to, to be a great board member and might reach out. Um, there are other ways that, that board members are found. Um, and you mentioned, you know, we do a lot of board searches. Um, a lot of our searches are for um, mid midsize uh, private equity firms up through the larger public firms. Those are the ones that typically go to search. Sometimes family owned businesses uh, ask us to do searches as well when they want to um, professionalize their boards more and bring outside resources in that, um, that have a different perspective than the rest of the family members who currently sit on the board. So um, it really can happen in a, in a number of different ways. The most important thing is just you know, when, when you're out there in, in your profession, show up the best possible way and, and you'll get recognized. A, yeah. a lot of it is very much word of mouth and, and reputation. Yes, and I was just right. add, add on to that, that um, you know, depending on where you are in your career, if you are thinking about retirement or planning for retirement at a certain point, that's a good time to start to reach out to the people that you know and let them know you are going to be retiring and you have an interest in boards and you'd love them to keep you in mind. Um, people like us always like to know <laughs> who's coming up for retirement next so that we can call on you um, when we have something interesting. That, that's a sweet spot, like right before you're going to retire, because I think for a lot of the people on our uh, webinar today, they're conflicted out from serving on a board while they're at the big company they're employed with. But as soon as they know they're sort of like six to 12 months away from retiring, that's the moment to reach out to Sarah and Suzanne. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Others um, okay, good, good, good. And um, so, um, you know, we all hear about your board bio. You have to have a great board bio. Do you have any tips for what should be in that board bio and how you prepare your board bio? And what is the board bio for people who don't know? Sure, well, I'll start and then Suzanne, you jump in here too, please. But um, I, I actually think it's important to have both a really proper resume or CV as well as a board bio. So the board bio doesn't substitute for having a good old fashioned CV as well. Um, so the, so the CV should be, you know, what we're all used to seeing, which is the chronology of your career with all of your titles and dates and everything you've done professionally. And then it should also have a section um, at the end, perhaps, that is your, your board experience. And that should be pretty detailed in terms of the, the board, nonprofit boards, or, or if there have been corporate boards that you've been on. 
um, as well as your role on those boards. So if you were on certain committees and the exact dates um, during which you were on the board or you held the committee roles, all, all of those specifics should be included there. And if it's a nonprofit that no one's ever heard of or may not have heard of, you would want to describe a little bit about who it is and um, what its mission is, just so someone who's reading it for the first time will, will understand. Um, so that's key. And then in terms of a board bio, you know, the, the board bio really should be um, a narrative about your professional career um, and the impact that you had. And it should also include uh, details about your, your board, the boards you've, you've sat on, again, whether they were corporate or um, nonprofit. And it just doesn't need to go into all the details with dates and things like that. It's, it's more of the the basics and of course it can have a little bit of personal information in it too that you may think that may be helpful to um, helping people get to know who you are. And is it appropriate because people send me their board bios to review all the time and I, I'm really not equipped to do that. I know what a nonprofit board bio should look like but I am not Suzanne and Sarah and so I don't know what you're looking for but I am very data driven so I like seeing metrics. I like seeing uh, I was in charge of the fundraising committee and under my five-year tenure, I tripled um, the amount of money that came in. Or is that too showy for a, a corporate board bio to put metrics in of like actual tangible accomplishments that you had on in your nonprofit board role? So, um, so I elaborating on both what Sarah said and, and your question, um, I, the way I view a board bio is uh, it's it's often a one-page narrative versus, to Sarah's point, the, the the CV being more of a chronology of your experience. And it starts uh, at the top with your value proposition. You know, what is it that makes you unique? So if you're sitting at a boardroom table, you will be the subject matter expert on X, Y, Z subjects, right? And and that is the data. That's that's the that's the tagline at the top. Um, so. You know, I know a lot about a sustainability. I've done a lot of merger and acquisitions. I've, I've um, overseen an IPO. What, whatever, whatever situations um, you you have personal um, experience with and, and would be considered a, an expert. And after that, there's usually a paragraph that it explains. You know, the type of board that you're looking for because you have this experience that they're looking for this, and therefore that's that round peg, round hole. And then the rest really is your career uh, experience that reinforces your assertion that you're an expert <laughs> in those areas, right. right? So you're kind of pulling off of your resume, saying, "And here I demonstrated this, and here I demonstrated that." And that's where the metrics come in. So if, if you've doubled si the size of the business through doing 12 acquisitions and integrating them successfully, and you've claimed you're an acquisition expert at the top, that's a great place to, to put that in. And so it's, it's, it's really a, a document that reinforces your, your initial assertion of your expertise Suzanne, across, that is across, so your, across your entire career. So it's really a cumulative statement of, of your career. I think that is so incredibly helpful. People really do not understand what to do with this board bio. They just keep hearing it's going to make or break you. But they, but, but then people get very nervous. Well, how do, how do I make mine really great? So that is just so helpful that you, you know, right there in that opening paragraph of this is why I'm special. This is my unique value. And then you spend the rest of that one page, not more than one page with examples. This is what we learn in law school. You make that argument and then you back it up with the support. So it's going to be like a legal document, a legal brief where you are, you're, even if there's something you did in your life that was really interesting, if it's not relevant to that one major point you're making, it's probably not there. Um, you're, you're building to this one argument that you made right at the front that's sort of your elevator pitch, for lack of a better word. Um, okay, I, Suzanne, I think that is such a great takeaway that it's so tangible that people can really work with. Um, so where do companies look for board members? Of course, they go to Spencer Stewart, but then in addition to going to Spencer Stewart, where else might they look for board members? So I, I can start, Sarah, and then you can, you can jump in for, for your world. Um, so they, they may look for search firms, as I mentioned before. Um, there are a number of clients who historically have looked out in their community. 
um, other community leaders that they've that they've respected that they think can bring a point of view on uh, on topics that they're wrestling with. Um, uh, a lot of times, professional services firms to the point of, of retiring. So, uh, their their former audit partner who's about to retire, <laughs> for example, um, you know, they they uh, they've known that person. That person knows them really well, and and they finally have gotten permission to be able to to serve. Um, former clients, it, there's usually a, about a three-year window, you know, with some of those relationships post-retirement. Um, the other, the other places, um, there are membership organizations that have emerged that um, are promoting particularly diversity. Um, so there's there's female-based organizations. There are uh, racially diverse-based organizations that are advocating for their members to post their resumes. And we're, we're seeing boards reach out through those organizations, especially with the rise of diversity, um, to asking um, and po posting their board positions and asking uh, people to apply based on, on the criteria that they're looking for. So I think, I think that's a relatively new trend, you know, maybe even within the last year or two, but it, it seems to be uh, taking hold. And Sarah, do, what did you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I think all those um, were good points about where uh, where we look for board members and where boards look for new board members. Um, I would say also in the world of, of the, the funds board world, um, there are a few industry associations that uh, have membership uh, through which boards often find new board members. So, um, for example, uh, there's the Independent Directors Council, the Mutual Fund Directors Forum, the Investment Company Institute. And these are all organizations that board members uh, spend time with, attend conferences with, et cetera. And so sometimes there's a flow of candidates through those. Um, and for you all as search consultants in this space, do you, um, do you look at, um, uh, in an industry that you're interested in, would you be looking at like, who's, who's speaking at this particular event? Like, is that something that would get uh, somebody noticed on your radar who you might not know about because maybe they lived in a part of the country you weren't following as much. Is it, is it helpful to speak at events in your industry to get your name raised either with the companies directly or with a Spencer Stewart? Does that, does that help or not so much? Suzanne looks skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't personally used that technique, but um, but maybe maybe others have. I, I I would say that networking is is the best possible way um, to you know you you mentioned uh, sending sending in people's information after this, getting getting to be part of our global database um, is is really the first step. Um, we, we have a database of over 3 million people uh, on the executive search side of things. Uh, our board database is, is a bit separate from that. Um, you kind of have to be qualified to, to be, be in there. But that being said, if, if you get in there, um, then you're available to any of our global consultants worldwide if they're working on a, an appropriate search, um, board search around the world. Um, Similar for our competition, they they have the you know they have the same uh, same approach. So you know, that's how you'd handle uh, search firms. Um, but also you know re reaching out and, and building relationships, and and that can happen at networking events like you were saying, where there is a speaker. I often go to the the industry events pre-pandemic that uh, uh, where you could do the meet and greets and, and get to know fantastic executives. And several of those have turned into to board relationships uh, as a result. So um, would not discount those uh, events at all. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I don't think speaking um, specifically is something that's gonna help get you onto a board, but I think in general, doing things to elevate your profile as an expert in certain categories um, is, is wise and, and things as simple as making sure you have a good LinkedIn profile, um, even in the board universe is, is helpful. In the, so in the nonprofit um, board community, one thing that has very much happened, and I, I should add that Suzanne and Sarah also are nonprofit board search pros as well. Um, but um, so please know they do it all. Um, 
But um, it, what, what we find at, at Board Assist, um, especially in the last three to five years, is um, if you are competing for spot on, on one of the more elite New York nonprofit boards, you better, one, have a LinkedIn profile, um, and two, you better have at least 500 contacts. Uh, because what I, I'll often have a really strong candidate who either doesn't have a LinkedIn profile, they're the head of a group at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or a big job at BCG, and they don't have a LinkedIn profile. And a lot of serving on a nonprofit board is about networking. Um, so um, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile or you don't have at least 500 candidates, they look at that as somebody who doesn't know how to network and nonprofit boards want people who are gonna network. And as we discussed 20 minutes ago, if you're going on a nonprofit board with the idea of shining, so you get picked for a corporate board, if you go on a nonprofit board and you can't shine because you can't network, then you, you didn't make it to the second step. So um, the, the LinkedIn profile is so important. Um, it didn't used to be, but it's, it's really disqualifying. I, I have nonprofit boards we work with that will not consider somebody that doesn't have a LinkedIn profile. Um, unless there's some like really great reason, like they're in some secret CIA cybersecurity job and nobody's supposed to even know that they live. But um, you know, that's just something to think about. Um, what are the hot skill sets that corporate boards are particularly excited about right now? And um, I think that cyber expertise is a big one of them, right? Cyber is definitely uh, very hot right now. Uh, particularly after the, the situations in the last couple of weeks, but uh, increasingly we're hearing from clients that they are uh, having, having issues relative to security that they have not had in the, you know, prior to this and they're, they're having to deal with it. So that's definitely hot. We, uh, I mentioned um, digital earlier. A lot of companies are trying to figure out post COVID um, where everybody has been living online. Whether, what their digital strategy is going to be, both in terms of working from home um, and uh, as well as product offerings, as well as getting their products to their, their customers as fast as Amazon, <laughs> because we've all been living with that. So uh, we actually just wrote a white paper on the impact of, uh, of COVID uh, on, uh, on accelerating the digital strategy. Um, so that's something top of mind with boards. Um, the, uh, the DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion topics, very important right now. A number of our clients are looking for uh, racially diverse directors who understand how to resonate with certain populations, um, both from their employee base as well as their, uh, their customer base. Uh, and, and bringing that lens to the boardroom like we've, uh, we've never seen before. Um, last year, if you look at the, the Spencer Stewart Index, you'll also note that um, I believe it's over 130 companies added new board positions to their board to be able to uh, allow uh, a, the addition of a female board director. And now every single S&P 500 um, company has, has a, at least one female director, which is fantastic. So diversity from that perspective. Uh, as well, and then and then ESG and sustainability um, is is a really hot topic. It's it's still something that people are are sorting out and trying to define for themselves and figure out how they're going to report and and navigate all of this. But uh, if you have experience, particularly in in that landscape, I would definitely have that at at the top of your board bio. <laughs> yeah, right. I agree. I think highlighting your familiarity or involvement with any of those topic areas um, in your board bio or your resume or your LinkedIn is very helpful. And to Suzanne's point about diversity being absolutely at the top of the list for basically every board out there. Um, also signaling in your LinkedIn what elements of diversity you may bring to the table so that people know, because sometimes it's not readily apparent from your name or even your picture. And um, I, I should have asked this two minutes ago when you were talking about that amazing database that Spencer Stewart has with the three million resumes. So when everybody today sends their resume to you, how do they make theirs pop? And it sounds like they need to highlight if they're adding diversity, they need to highlight any of the skill sets that we just discussed in a very clear way. Anything else they can do to make sure they pop among those three million resumes? <laughs> um, 
So I, I didn't mention global earlier. If, uh, if people have global backgrounds, particularly if they've lived um, in multiple continents uh, through the, the course of their career or their life, that's, that's also an area. But uh, what, when I'm coaching people about uh, building their resumes or their board bios, I often just say, you know, focus on the first half of the first page, <laughs> because uh, as you can appreciate, Sarah and I see a lot of resumes, as do our colleagues, um, and we, we need to be able to get what's special about you in that top half of the first page and, and then make a determination of whether we keep reading. So um, if you don't do anything else, just make sure that that, that top half really, really pops. Um, for the, I, I saw one of the questions in, in Q&A about uh, how much to, to proclaim that you're diverse, uh, whether it's female or, or racially diverse. Um, I, I would say it, it doesn't hurt. Most board bios include pictures uh, for what it's worth. Um, and uh, that's, that's completely acceptable. And, uh, and sends the signal to whoever is reading it you know, that, that you are diverse in, in some way, if, if in fact you are. So uh, with, with strongly, I, I know that's not typical on a CV, but I just thought I'd, I'd bring that up since it was in the Q&A. We've talked about this also a, a lot at uh, Board Assist and as a recovering lawyer, I wasn't exactly sure how much information we could um, ask of our candidates, you know, we'll often have um, a board that says to us, you know, we want to have um, uh, diversity in uh, sexual persuasion and like, well, like, how am I going to know that information? So now we as a practice, um, when somebody comes to us, we, we ask our candidates, is there something about your background that you think boards would value? Um, so before you all reach out to Spencer Stewart, ask yourself that question. You know, what, what in your background um, would, they, would they value because it adds a different voice to the table? Um, because if you don't tell them, they're, they're not gonna know. Um, so uh, you know, don't, I think that Suzanne and Sarah being very clear, they, they want to know that's, that's, that's part of who you are and it's valued and treasured. Um, so you know, be sure and share whatever that interesting background is. Um, uh, we have a question about what due diligence should you do before accepting a board offer? So now you've got all these great board offers. It's all going great. Now, now what should, should you be thinking about before you accept that offer? Sarah, do you want to start or would you like me to? <laughs> um, well, I can, I can start. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question. I think that um, you should, if you do have different offers to join different boards, you wanna think really carefully and make the right decision about which board you join. Um, I mean, first off, I think it's really important to think about where can you really contribute the most, right? Um, where are you gonna be the most valuable? Where can you have the most impact? Cause that will be where you're happiest and where you'll be most appreciated <laughs> um, and where you'll gain the best reputation. So for your future board work. So that's one really important thing to think through and study hard. Um, and you do that by sort of assessing who else is on the board and therefore, you know, how you will fill a gap or bring something new and different to the table. A second thing you can do is, is you can reference the other board members. So you can go out and do your own homework on those board members to understand, are they smart? <laughs> are they nice to work with? Do they have a nice boardroom dynamic? Um, do they have a healthy relationship with management um, that is constructive? Uh, these are all things that you can, that you can, and you should do to make sure that it's the right board for you. Um, also, I think obviously sort of goes without saying, I suppose, thinking about the actual, um, uh, state of the business uh, of the company you're joining and what that means for that board and you as a board member, is this going to be a positive experience where you will learn and grow and, um, and again, be able to contribute in a way that is helpful to the business. Those are just a few, few items. And, and along those lines, uh, if people are not familiar with the concept, uh, offer to sign a, a non-disclosure agreement, a, an NDA, and ask them for their financial statements, ask them for their strategic plans. Um, you want to know what you're getting yourself into, <laughs> uh, first and foremost, because then then you you're you're liable for it after that point. Uh, make sure that they have um, DNO insurance um, 
to protect you in the case of any, any litigation um, and make sure that those protections are in place. Um, and, and then to Sarah's earlier point, I often uh, suggest to folks that they sit down and, and list the five uh, criteria that they want both personally and professionally from a board. Um, so some people don't want to do their day job just in a different, <laughs> in, in a different setting, right? They want to do something different. So what are, what are the five personal and professional objectives you want out of a board? And, and hold true to that for as long as you can. A lot of times people will receive an offer for their first board and they're so flattered that they jump right at it and say, oh, I'm going to get in. But it might not be the best board for a number of different reasons. And so the earlier you can write those criteria down and, and use those as your yardstick um, to whether or not you're going to be happy and successful in the board, um, the, the clearer it makes those decisions. Um, and I'll, I'll just um, add for a few seconds on uh, joining a nonprofit board and whether um, you decide to accept the offer because we did call this how to join a corporate and then in parens and nonprofit board. So for those of you who came in late, uh, as you, uh, you may not know, we have a little booklet uh, called Giving Back that you can download from every page of the Board Assist website at boardassist.org on the FAQ tab. And it'll take you about 10 minutes to get through the booklet. It goes through all the things you should think about before you accept that nonprofit board offer. Uh, it's so interesting to me to hear Sarah and Suzanne speak just now because we have so much overlap on those questions. Uh, including finding out if there's DNO insurance, and we talk about that in the booklet. One thing that um, is not the case with a corporate board, but with a nonprofit board, in the unlikely event you're joining a nonprofit who does not have DNO insurance, uh, your homeowners or your renters policy probably covers nonprofit board service. But check with your insurance agent. That is not the same thing with corporate board service. But nonprofit board service is almost definitely already covered. The other thing you should know is DNO insurance in the nonprofit world is very inexpensive. So you might be the board member that comes on and says, fine, I'll just write the check for $1,000 so that everybody on the board is covered. It can be that little. Um, so um, that DNO is so important in the nonprofit and corporate board space, but it's much easier to address in the nonprofit board space. Um, in the nonprofit board space, uh, I, I just thought it was, again, so interesting that Sarah and Suzanne uh, we're saying what I say all day long, which is to really, really understand um, who these other people you're going to be serving with are. And what we always tell everybody is pull everyone's LinkedIn profile and look and see who they're connected with that you know. And if it turns out everybody on this board is connected with like the people that you have disliked your whole life because that person pulled your hair in second grade and the other person um, you know, did something inappropriate when you were a first year associate. Um, for whatever reason, if you don't like everybody that these people know, it might feel like a little signal to you that this isn't a great fit. The more likely situation, certainly with nonprofit board service, because it's the best people who join nonprofit boards because it's busy people who are making time to give back. Um, and more likely you're going to go on and you're going to see, wow, everybody on this board knows five people I really like. That's, that's a really good sign for me. So um, it is so important to think about, you know, am I really going to uh, enjoy working with these people and be able to work well with these people? And then you want to be um, seeing how everybody, um, and I think it was Sarah alluded to this, you want to see how they work together. You're going to be seeing when you're going to that dinner with them, you're going to see how they interact with the management of the organization. You're going to see how they interact with each other. And um, you'll be able to decide whether that's, that's a good fit for you, whether it's a corporate board or a nonprofit board. Um, I had a question you were talking about where the company is in their life cycle. Um, a lot of times people we know will get a board offer from an organization that's in trouble. And um, maybe that's why this is going to be your first board offer is that the more traditional choices all said no, because the company has like a 50-50 chance of going under. Um, I'm curious where you two come out. Is it is it a terrible idea to join one of those boards where if that first board is all about like how you get that next board. If you go on the board of an organization and it goes under while, while you've just joined or in the first year you've been on there, in retrospect, would it have better, been better if you had not been on that board? 
Well, I, I can offer my perspective. I know a, a number of people because we've had clients who have been in turnaround situations that just come out of chapter 11, for example, and they're recruiting new board members and a number of board members who have been actually attracted to that opportunity uh, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, the situation was familiar to them. Um, they weren't scared by it. They, they had done their homework and the due diligence on the financials and the strategy to, to see kind of the, the way forward and whether or not that, that was doable uh, from their perspective. Um, sometimes board members are, are granted uh, equity as part of their compensation. And so there's a value creation opportunity there to help lead through. So um, it, it really depends more about your experience and your confidence in those situations to be able to help guide the organization to a better place. If you haven't faced that situation before, um, it probably is not the best first board <laughs> for, for you. Um, but uh, it really depends on, uh, on kind of how you grew up in business. Yeah, and I mean, if you join a board like that and you are really part of the board that turns around the company, you will have made a great name for yourself. So it certainly can be a good thing, but you do need to assess it carefully. Well, and you know, another question I, I wanted to ask you when we were talking, for example, about cyber expertise um, uh, uh, 20 minutes or so ago, uh, I, I know somebody who's very, very accomplished uh, professional here in New York. They're very interested uh, in going on several boards. And, oh, Julia's joining us. Um, so, Julie, thank you so much for making time to be with us. Julie had an emergency board meeting, funnily enough, that she had to go to. So uh, we're so happy that she's with us now. And as you all know, because uh, I mentioned this earlier, uh, Julie is the head of the North American practice at Spencer Sierra in uh, the corporate board practice. And Julie, you're on mute right now. Um, so just, just so you know that. Um, Julie, what I was about to ask is, so I, I, um, I know uh, this, uh, I have a friend who is a very senior professional in New York. She's never sat on a non uh, corporate board rather. She sits on several nonprofit boards. And she's very, very interested in corporate board service. And um, she's kind of getting nowhere with it, even though she has a very big job that she's about to retire from. Um, and what she was told repeatedly was, listen, you're a woman, and if you could become a cybersecurity expert, uh, I could put you on a ton of really, really good boards. And so this friend of mine said, well, I, I don't know anything about cybersecurity. And um, the corporate board headhunter she's been talking to said, well, then I would learn. Um, <laughs> she, and the, the advice she was given was, it's not that hard to become a cybersecurity expert so that you would be attracted to a board. I'm like, it's, really, it's not that hard. You could just pick that skill up. I mean, is that something you can just teach yourself how to be a cybersecurity expert? Or does that sound pretty wacky? <laughs> Well, I, I hope the, the person she was talking to was not from Spencer Stewart. They were not. <laughs> it seems very wacky to me. Um, and it's diminishing of, uh, you know, it's uh, of what we've all, everybody's done as for whatever it is that you're an expert in, to think that somebody could come in and take two classes and that would be the comparable to your whole career is crazy. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's really bad advice. You know, if you join a board and you want to learn more about that topic, I think that makes a lot of sense, but you would never put yourself up as an expert on it, you know, so. Okay, well, Julie, we were saving the hard, we were saving the hard questions for when you came on. <laughs> I don't believe that. But. Now that you're here, um, the other, uh, before we go to, we have 18 questions sitting in the Q&A pile, uh, but before we get to those 18 questions, the hardest question is, um, you know, we were talking uh, a little bit about um, how there are a lot of organizations that reach out to people who want to go on a board and say, listen, if you pay me $1,000 a year, I'll put you in our corporate board book. I'll, we'll have three trainings and then once a year we'll have a corporate board fair where the 10,000 people have each paid us $1,000 a year will have a chance to interview with this one board that's gonna hire someone. So what, what can people do to um, separate all the noise from the organizations that might actually be helpful at um, helping raise their board profile? Do you have just any sort of general pointers on how to separate out the noise? 
So there are a lot of people out there uh, and a lot of organizations trying to, uh, I, I don't want to say they're all trying to capitalize on right. this, but um, so, you know, that ranges from uh, you know, someone, a firm in Chicago, Suzanne, that uh, will, if you pay them $125,000, they represent you in the market and act as your agent. There are universities who, uh, you know, for around $12,000, you go for two or three days and they're, they're trying to help you think about how you get on a board and a little bit of education about board positions. And then there are a lot of groups out there that are doing just what you were saying. It's, you know, pay me $2,500 or, um, and it's, you know, I don't think most of them are very, are successful at all. Having said that, there are one or two that I think are, um, you know, have been doing it for a while and their intention is correct and I don't think it's about making money and some you know one of them started I don't even think they charged anybody in the beginning um so it it's a little bit but but mostly they are it is not an effective way to get on a board um and you know some of them try to work with you to help you think about how to get on a board and how to write a board bio which FYI I don't know if Sarah or Suzanne have we did not I hate uh, but um, but they'll help you do that and they'll help you think about you know like putting together a plan on how you can help yourself get on a board you know some of that might be useful but that you're not going to get on a board through these organizations has been my experience. I would ask Suzanne and Sarah what you think. No, so they wanted to wait till you got on for that one, Julie. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, and, and, you know, there are a lot of organizations who are not doing it for money. So they are P, the groups that in a city, you know, like, uh, the, the, you know, the, it, the, that will, Put together a board book of women there that uh, people in that community can access. There's no down. I don't. Think, I don't see any downside to that um, because people are doing it. You know, uh, they're doing it for the right reason. They're trying to help their members or whatever it might be. And there may be companies who reach out to them to get uh, to to ask for names. So I don't. There's. I don't see that there's a downside. I don't think there's much upside. You know, I don't think I don't think people reach out to those organizations as often as maybe they should or we think they would. But, you know, it's, it's a small chance that they'll be helpful. But um, but I would do those before I do one where you, you know, pay for advice and going to a big meeting where there's hundreds of people. So yeah. what I tell people, because I um, what I was saying to Sarah and Suzanne earlier is, um, after you all who get asked this question more often than anybody in the country, how do you get on a corporate board? I get asked this question 10 to 20 times a day um, because of the space that board assist is in. And in general, um, the advice that we give is um, if it's your business school or your college and they are gathering resumes of women of color for their board book or you know, whatever um, group that they're gathering, um, there's no downside. Why, why not share your resume? If someone is not asking you for any money, they're just um, offering you this opportunity. If somebody is asking you for money to help you with your corporate board search, just as Julie said, um, if they're offering you money because they're going to give you some coaching on what your board bio should look like, although Suzanne and Sarah just told you everything you need to know for free. Um, so, um, there's, there's not anything more that they're going to tell you that you didn't already hear from Sarah and Suzanne who covered it so well. But counseling you in that way is one thing. Anybody who's saying, uh, we're going to get you on a board if you pay us money, I before I, Sarah's nodding her head. She knows mm -hmm. like we're all four of us are going on this. If someone's going to charge you money and they're going to tell you they're going to get you on a board, I would talk to at least three people that, who have been through that program and given money to that organization and had a positive result. Um, because like the ladies of Spencer Stewart, I've never seen that work well where you pay somebody a lot of money to get you on a board. I, I never have seen that work well. Well, and, um, and the, other, the other question that I would ask is, 
how how do they make the relationships with the the nominating and governance committee and those who are the decision makers on boards? Because uh, as as Julie knows, uh, we had this conversation not too long ago. I I have a client where we have a retained search for board search, and they said that one of these firms that we're talking about had just sent over three resumes in case they need a board director. Well, none of them were to the specification of what they were looking for. They just floated these resumes and. And I said, you know, is there any reason that you need to consider these? You know, is there any is there any background to this? And they explained the background was from one of these firms, but were they relevant? No. So they, they might they might share that they've they they've shared your resume, but you know, in terms of the likelihood of of it happening, it wasn't very high. Right, and it, you know, it's the same thing with, with board assist. We do not send unsolicited candidate resumes to nonprofits. Nonprofits come to us first, we screen them, we work with them, we find out that they're missing that cybersecurity person or whatever that person is, and then we make a match. And that's that's a big difference. But you know, also if you're talking to one of these organizations that wants to charge you money, I would ask them for numbers of how many people are paying you and how many board seats did you uh, uh, match last year. So if a thousand people are paying you and you did three matches last year, I don't really like those odds. Um, Julie, you look like you had something you wanted to say right there. No, no, I just agree with you. I think oh. that, I think that's actually really good advice you're giving. Uh, well, thank you. Um, all right. So we have 21 questions to get through in four minutes. Here we go. <laughs> uh, we have a question about a lot has been stated in the press about the lack of technology experience board members to provide their governance perspective. Seems like most boards still have not included that expertise. Um, is that true? Um, and why do you why do you think this? Why what do you think is impacting this? Okay, we can skip that if you don't have a quick answer for that. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. No, I think it, I think it's a good question. I mean, boards need technology, and I'm sure these guys have already talked about. It. There's just not a lot of turnover in the boardroom, so they you know they probably all would like some technology in the room but they just don't have the seats and and or oh, they, interesting yeah or when when a seat opens up they need a chair of the audit committee even though you know they they do need technology so i think there is a real interest in tech uh it's just this this lack of uh of uh, this lack of openings and lack of turnover and, and, and I also, go, ahead. go ahead, Susan. I was just going to, I'd also say um, tech means a lot of different things to different people. So it could be, as we talked about the cybersecurity piece, it could be uh, the digital channels to market, it could be IoT, it could be innovation. Um, so uh, so defining what is most strategically important for the board is, is part of the process too. Um, somebody asked if Spencer Stewart is a global firm. Yes, indeed, they are. It's their, 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 uh, Julie, I was talking you all up before you got here. They are the leading corporate board service, um, uh, um, everywhere. So yes, everywhere. Uh, somebody asked about a picture for the board bio. We talked about that. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay. Um, somebody asked about startup boards. Um, is, is that a good first step for somebody for their first board? Is there any reason not to go on a startup board as your first board? Julie, you wanna take that one? Julie, they're leaving all the hard ones for you. I, I think it just depends on where you are in your journey. You know, if you're young, then, and, and this is, you know, your first step that might make sense, but then you have to think about you join a board, you have your, you know, you should think about it as at least a 10 year commitment. So, you know, if you do something like that, are you, are you putting yourself out of the market for 10 years for something bigger? If you're uh, looking to build a portfolio, you're retired and you want to have several boards, then that might be interesting in contrast to other bo another board that's you know kind of more more established. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It's really what you are in yours. But I think it is really important to remember that these are long-term commitments. Not that a nonprofit board isn't a long-term commitment, but they tend to have term limits. They tend to be you know six year or nine year. And corporate boards don't have that. So you can't just join for a couple of years 
and then say, you know what, that was great. I learned a lot. Now I'm going to leave. It just doesn't work like that. And, and Julie raises a, a point that we didn't touch on that's super important. If you're currently employed you, and you're thinking about for-profit board service, you're going to likely need to get permission from your organization to serve. And that's either your CEO, your general counsel, sometimes it's your, your actual board. So checking that ahead of time. And then usually there are exceptions to the rule, but usually uh, if you're given permission, you're only allowed to serve on one outside board. So choose wisely um, to, to her point about you might be you might be there for a while and, and limit your options. <laughs> so I think both, both of those are things to, to uh, as part of your due diligence to, to do going into this. That, that's such an important point. And um, as I referenced before in um, the board assist book, Giving Back, which you can download from the website, we talk about this idea of joining a startup board versus a more established company board um, or a more established nonprofit. And um, for your first board in the nonprofit space, it, it can be a better idea not to join a startup, but to join something that has more structure where you can learn from uh, in a more structured environment. Um, so in the, you know, in the nonprofit board space, it's a startup is probably not your best board. It seems like it's going to be great and you're going to be able to be very hands-on, but you might benefit from the experience of being on that more established board. And uh, we talk about that in the booklet, so I don't need to take up your time talking about that now. Um, somebody asked if there's a, a template somewhere that you ladies would recommend for what a board bio should look like. Is it maybe something on the Spencer Stewart website or someplace else? We, we, uh, we have one um, that, that we could perhaps send to you, Cynthia, and, and okay. you could distribute as needed. Need um, okay, that, that sounds great, because I'm, I'm seeing, I, I, I know this is gonna be a question for, for everyone. Um, okay. Uh, uh, all right. Um, there's a question um, about uh, the financial expectations with serving on a nonprofit board. Um, so I, we talk about that extensively in our book, Giving Back. Um, it's, it's a very, um, there's a lot of pieces to it. It's what you personally give, it's what you get from others. Um, they may not be interchangeable. And as I said, we discuss that a lot in our, our free little booklet on our website, boardassist.org. So take a look there. And um, I think that you'll have uh, all those answers or questions answered. Um, so I promised the ladies of Spencer Stewart who have 3 million resumes to go look at <laughs> that I would have them off at one o'clock and I'm almost like good to my word. Uh, we are so incredibly grateful to have the collective wisdom of the three of you with us today. Um, people are so interested in corporate board service. I really haven't known where to begin advising people. And I, it's, it's so generous of you that the three of you spent an hour with us today and that you're willing to uh, receive resumes um, for that great Spencer Stewart database from everybody who's participating with us today. Um, everybody will receive the contact information to send that to after um, we finish today. We'll also have a recording of our conversation that you can see if you had, if you joined late or had to leave early. Um, and we're just so grateful for the Spencer Stewart team's um, wisdom and support today. We really, really appreciate it. And we are also very, very grateful that they drove home the message that start with the nonprofit board. We really need you for nonprofit board service and you'll have a great time. You'll feel good about yourself. You'll meet some terrific people and you will be that much closer to getting um, to a great corporate board with Sarah, Suzanne and Julie. So um, I can't thank you ladies enough. Thank you all for who are watching with us today and um, good luck on your board journeys. Take care. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.